Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Here we are at Wolfie's Grill yet again. Time to talk Boilermaker basketball. Wolfie's Grill on the Wabash Landing right here in West Lafayette. And indeed, I am Rob Blackman. It's so nice to have you with us tonight as we talk Boilermaker basketball over the next 55 minutes with the Purdue head coach, Matt Painter. He will join me here in just a moment. Uh, lots of things to talk about, certainly, especially when you consider if you want to go, just go back Oh, let's just say a week from this past Saturday when Purdue played a home game against Michigan, the Boilermakers have just gone through a stretch where they played four games over eight days, winning three of the four, beating Michigan once, losing at Michigan, beating Illinois, and also beating Maryland. And, of course, the Maryland victory coming yesterday in dramatic fashion at Mackey Arena. So a whole lot of topics we, uh, we can talk about with Coach Painter. Also, uh, the, the, uh, the busy schedule continues. Purdue is on the road Wednesday night, a 9 o'clock game. Yes, another 9 o'clock game, you know, this time at Northwestern on Wednesday night. And then Purdue back at home Sunday against a Rutgers team that really seems to be playing its best basketball of the season uh, at this point in the year. So it uh, doesn't get any easier for our Boilermakers, but what would we expect in the month of February and uh, in the Big Ten? If you'd like to visit with Coach Painter tonight, please uh, give us a phone call, one 888 246-2678, uh, And again, uh, we do realize that it is Valentine's night. So uh, thank you, everyone that's joining us on this Valentine's evening, especially if you have brought your uh, significant other with you. Uh, so we do say thank you. And I also have to question uh, just what your love life looks like if you're at the coaches show on Valentine's night. But we are still happy to have you anyway. Uh, and for those that chose to wear black instead of red, by the way, thank you, too, for that on Valentine's. Uh, Coach Painter joins us when we come back. This is Boilermaker Basketball from Learfield. Jaden Ivey all in the top ten. As here is Ivey into the body to roll it in. I mean, Zach Eady and Travion Williams always stay away from each other's drum set. Saw the Step Brothers poster in the crowd. <laughs> and here is Hunter down the lane for two. Eric Hunter's first point. Goes the same way down here. It was a big time play by Coburn. They had the first six of the game combined, and Eady matches Coburn again. That could have easily. Stefanovic shows up. Coburn misses, and the follow won't be there. It is knocked around to Hunter for Purdue. Stefanovic, quick trigger for three. It's a one-point game. First place of the Big Ten on the line. That was a bear hug from Demonte Williams, and still Ivy scores. Oh, he's just sitting on that right hand, but it just doesn't matter. Plummer hits the deck. Had his pocket picked. Hunter to the rim. Oh, this is his half. I don't have to tell you. I'm telling them. I mean, Here's Ivy into the lane for what Purdue, and he got it for Reedy in a stuff. That is so good from Jaden Ivy. Misses the shot and the rebound for Caleb First, who's played some big minutes for Purdue in this game. Ivy, double clutch for two. See what Ivy does now. Poking and prodding and leaning, and he kicks it out. Got a look for Thompson, and he got it for three. Ivy oh, lost his man, open. got to get it to him. Frazier's down. And he buried the three. It's Frazier reaching for his leg. We'll get a timeout. First place in the Big Ten on the line. If Purdue wins, it's a three-way tie. Eating upstairs. No. Got another one, and he hammers it. He smacked it right back at him. And then they take it away with Gillis. Ivy wants and welcome back, everyone. Matt Painter Radio Show tonight brought to you by Jimco Constructors. Jimco Constructors supporting your Boilermakers is the presenting sponsor of the Matt Painter Show and proud partner of Purdue Athletics. Jimco Constructors says boiler up. Purdue winning yesterday over Maryland, which means the Boilermakers are 22-4, and 11-4 in the Big Ten with five regular season games remaining. And in case you missed it earlier today, the latest Associated Press Top 25 poll has come out. Purdue is ranked fifth in this week's top 25 poll. Purdue head coach Matt Painter is alongside. Again, if you'd like to visit with coach, 1-888-246-2678. Coach Painter, when you joined uh, myself and Bobby Riddell on the post-game show last night or yesterday afternoon after the win over Maryland, I thought uh, the last comment you made to us before you signed off was maybe the most significant. You said what this team needs right now is practice time, mm -hmm. right? And uh, with uh, I mentioned a moment ago, 
four games in eight days. There just hasn't been a lot of time to practice, has there? No, there hasn't. And, you, and you, uh, you, as a coach, you got two things that you have to deal with at that time. You know, you want to give them the best chance to physically play well. But then you also, from a mental standpoint, you have to be on edge. So you got to try to balance both of those things. If you got four games in eight days, obviously in between those games, you don't want to practice long and hard, obviously. But you also want to have an edge. And you've seen in the last couple games for us that we didn't have that edge, but yet you're trying to save their legs because they're playing a lot of games in a short amount of time. So just have to try to do um, a better job of getting them ready to play. It's nothing from a schematic standpoint of just being on edge, not playing through your scoring, and being able to function um, as, as a whole, especially when the ball doesn't go in. I think that's the one thing that is a silver lining from our Maryland game because we didn't play very well is the fact that the ball didn't go in for us and we still found a way to win a game, which I don't know if we could have done that a month ago. And we, we do have a group that really feeds off of scoring, and we've been pretty consistent in that area. And then our defense hasn't been quite as good, whereas now in this last game, we I think we're I, – I know we were better from a defensive standpoint, but yet at Michigan in the game before that, we really had our struggles, especially in the second half. We tried a lot of different things, but – um, you know, we just have to do a better job on both ends of being efficient and being able to stop our opponent. Well, you talk about how important it is to put the ball in the basket. I know that sounds so basic, but that loss at Michigan, your team is 4 of 18 from the three-point line. You start the game against Maryland 4 of 14, but you finish 4 of 6 from three, and right. it's amazing how much better your team seems to play when that ball's going in the bucket. Yeah, you know, it's, it's going to help your defense. Obviously, you're setting your defense anytime you're scoring the basketball, even though people can take it out quick and uh, push it up the court. But anytime you're scoring the ball and you're setting your defense, you're really going to give yourself a chance. Uh, so I need to ask the question. I know I asked it post-game yesterday, but I'll admit I'm still probably just as confused as I was when I asked the question yesterday. That final 8.1 seconds of the game, right? can you talk our fans through exactly at least how it's been explained to you from the, the Big Ten officials? Yeah, well, it, it started by just they, they were talking, the officials and the scores table, about not starting the clock because we like to pass the ball along the baseline when we can move. Right. Um, obviously, they start the clock, and when we throw it along the baseline and they throw it and they realize it. So where I made my mistake was I said to one of the officials, we're redoing this, right? I, and, and so we're just starting it back over. So if we're redoing it, then we can run the base. We can do it again. But they let our two of our guys know. They didn't let me know. The guy said yes, but it was, it was too much of a – it was, it was just a vague question on my part. I had to say, hey, can we pass the ball along the baseline? Can we run here? And I didn't do that. I was trying to get our guys set up. And the time to me was, you know, whether it's 8-2, 8-3, 8-4, 7-8, like whatever, like I'm trying to get our guys in the right spots to run what we called. And so now I'm trying to get them back in that position. And so I don't see the difference of it. But he tells our guy, on two different occasions, and you can see it on the video, you have a spot. So it wasn't like, you know, they were negligent in that area. The officials were not negligent in that, in that area. He told us that didn't register with our guy. So when it didn't register with our guy and they did it, you know, that's th – there lied the problem. So that's, that's what happened. Why, when that happens and – the rule needs to be changed, and it probably will end up getting changed. When you pass the ball on the baseline and you make an error at the scorer's table, the team on offense who has the ability to run the base shouldn't get penalized from an error from them. You should go back to the original time and redo the play. Gotcha. Because now we didn't do anything wrong. Why put that team at a disadvantage now and they're stuck and they can't move, which everybody knows when you're pressing and, and you can't move along the baseline, you've made it harder to inbound the basketball. But, but, but to clarify, so that is not the rule currently. You don't go back and reset the clock to no, where it was. No, they didn't recognize it until the ball was passed 
and we were catching the basketball. So by rule, if, if time is a lapse off the clock, they at least got to take three tenths off the clock. That's why you saw the three tenths. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you for the explanation because that I've heard a lot of folks talking about th that today. Probably a lot of you folks have. Uh, uh, we are going to go to the phones in just a minute. Let's uh, let's do this. Let's take a quick break and then we will head to the telephone lines again. One eight 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 two four six two six seven eight. If you'd like to visit with Coach Painter tonight, uh, the Coach Painter Show is brought to you by Jimco, and we are live as always from Wolfie's Grill. This is Boilermaker Basketball from Learfield. Here's Ivy. The high screen from Edie. Drives and leads it in. Now I get it. Look, Penn State, 9 o'clock tip. Long day. Hard to get up for. Here's Mason Gillis. Three breakdowns that have led to easy baskets for Michigan. Williams working on Dickinson to jump hook. Count it. And the foul. Now back into his own. Yeah, into the 2 3. Here's Williams. And gets the roll. Ivy drives. Lays it off the window. So explosive with that first step. Too many breakdowns of responsibility are going to give Michigan confidence. Here's Edie. Oh. Oh. Count it. And one. Williams. The hook is good. <laughs> it's just pretty. It's pretty, isn't it? Man. The high low action. That one's knocked away. Right, now you need the space to see if you can keep this matchup. The problem is now you got to switch back off. That's very good. Wow, absolutely. Let's play some one on one. Dickinson's got 12. Travion's got eight. Make it <laughs> ten. <laughs> so good. Hey, your turn. Ivy, step back three. Got it. Diabate working on Gillis. Stolen by Hunter Jr. Brooks turns the corner and Ivy. Welcome back, everyone, to the Matt Painter Show, presented by Jim Co. Live tonight at Wolfie's Grill with the largest view of the game outside of Mackey Arena. Rob Blackman here with Matt Painter. Just had a question in-house during the commercial just to clarify. The reason it ends up being a turnover for Purdue, once you have a spot throw-in, you may no longer throw the ball along the baseline out of bounds. You may not you may not run the baseline. You may not throw the ball along the baseline once it's a spot, spot throw-in, which is what uh, the call was, and that's why Purdue was called for a turnover because Purdue did try to throw the ball across the baseline. Uh, let's go to the phones. Chuck in Indianapolis is first. Chuck in Indy, welcome to the show. You're on with the coach. Thank you very much. A couple of thank yous before the comment or the question. Thanks to Rob. You really enjoy the broadcast and appreciate all your hard work. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, to, to, you're welcome. To Coach Painter and his staff and team, just a big thank you uh, for all the hard work that goes into a season. Uh, I know there's, it looks glamorous to many, but I know there's a lot of hard work, so thank you for that. <clears throat> question was on the ball screen, uh, which obviously has given us trouble lately. And so my question is, are the players just not – are they not executing what the coaching staff has asked them to do on the ball screen? Or is it more a matter they're just – the skill set is such that we don't have the team that's capable of guarding it the way you want it to be guarded? Oh, you're talking about us defending the ball screen? Yes. Yeah. Well, we've done a couple different things. It's not like we do the same thing always. Um where you see, if you pay attention to where, like, how Illinois and Michigan defends a ball screen, they do a total drop. So what they do is they, they, they don't let you have a turn down on a ball screen. So they don't let you reject it and go the other way. They send you over the ball screen. Depending on who you are, they want to go under it or they want to stay into the basketball on it and stay tight, uh, for lack of a better word. I'm trying to speak to your vernacular instead of my vernacular. Yeah. Um, and, and so with that, you get a lot of space. You'll see a lot of the NBA guys, well, they'll box out their, their on-ball defender right there and keep him on their hip. And then they want to drop. And we start up high and we try to drop most of the time. We mix things up. 
We down some things on the wing where we box you in right there. But if you've got a good three-point shooter as a big, we stay away from that because it limits that a little bit. It doesn't eliminate it, but it just um, it minimizes the opportunities for them to get something there. So what we have done a lot of is, is being flat up on the ball screen, and then as it comes, we're trying to drop and be level with our guy. So what that does is when you drop and you're level with your guy and you go back with him, it doesn't allow that, that, that guy who's on the outside as he's coming, he doesn't have to come in and, and they call it tagging or bumping and bump on that big guy. And now you see a lot of those passes back for those open three-point shooters. Now if you stay level with your man and you don't allow him behind you, now you can stay on the same plane with your man behind and you don't give up the, the dive for the dunk. You don't give up the three on the backside. And what you force them into is either jump stopping or dribbling through or taking a tough in-between shot. And that's what you want. Analytically, it's really pushed in that area to where you want free throws, you want layups, you want dunks, and you want rhythm threes. The in-between shots that we all worked on when we were growing up and you had to have that pull up and you had to be able to make that play, that's really a end of game, end of half, low, clock, low shot clock play. If you shoot a lot of those, um, the percentages say that, that that's not going to be advantageous. But what you saw in our game other night with some of the ball screen stuff was a breakdown um, with our big a couple times. Our big came up. Now, to his defense on one of them, he came up because Fats Russell had come off that screen and knocked it down, and our guard didn't do a good enough job of staying into the basketball. So they, as they come up, you want to be able to step out at least two steps at that time, east and west, and then you want to get your drop. Now, the guy that's there is the guard outside of the play that has the shooter rolling up top. He's got to be able to read that and says, if the five's diving and he's behind him, I got to go stop this layup, and then I really got to scamper and get back um, to my man. Now, the guy on the ball has got to get his hands up when he does that so he can buy some time for that ball not to get directly passed back to his man. But when you get good at it and then somebody breaks down, that, that guard's not used to that breakdown then. And so, like, he's, he's kind of shocked by it. That happened to us twice in the game, and we gave up points. Five got two extended, and now that guard had really been staying with his man and limiting those shots. And so that's where you saw a couple of those breakdowns um, but I think it's the best thing to do for us, uh, especially with Zachary. Um, Travion will come up in that ball screen D, and Travion will get steals. And so, like, you see him at the end of the Iowa game, he gets two steals. Um, he had another play at the Wisconsin game the guy called a foul for, and he gets a steal. But if you come up there and you reach and you don't get a steal – now that big is behind you and your hands aren't up in the air and it's easy to pass. So it's one of those feast or famine things. If you go for a steal there and you don't get it, you're really exposed at the rim and you're in trouble. That's why we really encourage him not to do it. Um, he still does it at times and he still has success doing it at times. But you want that consistency. In, in basketball, the one thing you'll hear uh, people talk about is staying connected. And so if I do what I'm supposed to as, as the center – and you do what you're supposed to as the, the guard on the ball, now the other three guys that are zoning off and making those reads, there's nothing that's shocking them because we're doing our job. Right as I don't do my job or you don't do your job, you have disconnected our defense because you're not doing what you're supposed to. I always call it an evacuation plan. Like there's never really a good evacuation plan after somebody messes up or if two people messes up. People score in basketball outside of the NBA normally when there's a mistake. Then there's a mistake and they capitalize. If you don't make a mistake and they score, you'll hear coaches talk about, hey, we can live with that. And they always go, well, why do you want to live with it? Because we did everything we're supposed to. And if we keep doing everything we're supposed to, they're going to have a little bit of success, but they're not going to have a lot. I hope I answered that and it's clear to you in what you're yeah. asking me. Chuck, thank yep. you for the phone call. Good stuff. More in two minutes with Coach Painter. The Painter Show brought to you by Jimco. We're back in a moment. This is Boilermaker Basketball from Learfield. No doubt about that. What a lob and what a start. Stefanovic up top for Zakini. Underneath and Wahab couldn't catch it. Gillis dropping a dime. This 
Purdue team that was blown out in Ann Arbor on Thursday. Slavonovic badly needed triple. As the other guys relish the opportunity to see what they can do in an expanded role, and oftentimes it plays out like this, and there's Edie, one of the first offensive rebounds. And a beautiful setup on that last sequence by Martinez. That is Ivy. If Purdue can't adjust to dealing with the pick and roll action, they're going to have a tough time coming all the way back in this one. Nothing they can do with that from Edie. But right now, Purdue facing its largest deficit of the afternoon. Stefanovic, that's a three point jack. This is an excellent free throw shooting team. Russell again, it's a good look. Offensive rebound, Wahab. Goes right back up top, and he's pancaked by Edie. If you do it in four minutes or more, that kind of run, that's, a, that's what we call the jaw. But this is a run. Purdue has retaken the lead. Purdue 21 and 4, number three team in the country. Can Maryland steal one here in West Lafayette? That is Williams in a thing of beauty. Double bonus for both teams. Every whistle here. Here comes Ivy. He puts it down. And Eric Turner still tried to get it inside. Inbound to Scott, turns the corner to the wreck. Knocked out of his hands, Gillis has it. Now to Williams, and it is over. It's the Matt Painter Show live tonight from Wolfie's Grill. We will be here next Monday night as well, talking Boilermaker basketball from 6 to 7. Wolfie's Grill, the largest view of the game outside of Mackey Arena. Back to the phones we go, and uh, Jeremy checks in from Buffalo Grove, Illinois. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, Matt, I was just wondering, at the end of the first half, um, when Hunter and Thompson both had their intentional fouls, yes. I know those are probably um, intentional, but then Ivy picked up his second yes. foul, and then yeah. in yeah. the second half had to go to the bench with three. Was that on purpose, or is that just a miscommunication? Yeah, we won, you know, all those guys, they were running the same thing to bring the point guard with the ball, and then he lets his man cut there, and, you, you know, you want to be able to get that foul, but you don't want him to get that foul at that point. Um, but you, you don't want to stop him from scoring. And in, in a crazy way, we traded points right there because the guy got the technical at that right. time. And then we scored two points, and obviously they don't get a shot off there, and then we're able to bring Zach in there. But, no, we obviously didn't want him to be able to get two, and that's what I was saying was like, you know, who's in that position, who's there. I was, I was asking them how many that they had because they were the ones coming. And then he lets his man cut and get the ball right there, kind of in that funny spot. Um, we wanted to push it out. We wanted them to throw the ball and angle our guy to throw the ball towards half court so they weren't in a position to catch right away and shoot it so they'd have a dribble or two dribbles, and then we could get a foul and they could run a little bit of time off. Um, but we obviously didn't want that. Back to the phones, TK from Houston joining us next. TK, welcome to the show. You're on with Coach Painter. Hello. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, Coach Painter, man, I've been watching you since the beginning, since you took over from Katie. I uh, hope you guys uh, can, can get a deep run in March. And thanks for being the coach. Thank question, you. Um, question is, uh, man, you all played Michigan twice in five days, but it, it seemed like you all played a completely different team. So my question is, what was the main difference other than one being at home and one on the road Yeah, uh, it, that contributed to the you know big disparity in the result? I know Diabate and, and yep. uh, Dickinson together were a problem, but I think they started both in both games. Yeah. Well, Diabate wasn't, uh, wasn't a factor in the first game, and Diabate was a factor in the second game. Hunter Dickinson was a factor in both. Um, they make 12 threes from three people um, in our game. Um, the game before that at Penn State, they don't get into the 60s. They don't shoot the ball well. The game after ours, they hit three total threes by one person. Right. So uh, Eli Brooks goes four for four in our game. Then he hits three against Ohio State. Uh, Caleb Houston and uh, Dickinson both go four for six, if I'm not mistaken. Then neither one of them hit one in the Ohio State game. Um, they were shooting air balls in the Penn State game. They had a handful of air balls in that game. And so Coach Katie used to always say this. It, it's not who you're playing, it's when you're playing them. And sometimes it just works for you and somebody's played you at the wrong time and then whether you're there. But 
in the second time, like it's 24 to 24 in the game. Uh, we just had way too many breakdowns defensively, and obviously we couldn't get anything going from an offensive standpoint. Um, you see it a lot in the NBA. Like they'll play like a, a back-to-back versus somebody. Milwaukee will play in Indiana on a Tuesday, and then Indiana will play at Milwaukee on a Thursday. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens two or three times. Obviously, one of my former assistants, Micah Shrewsbury, he would kind of talk about those things. He'd say, like, we would just smoke somebody on the Tuesday. And he goes, but just human nature, human behavior, like these are good teams. Like Michigan has a good team. Michigan was picked to win our league. I know they haven't had from a record standpoint, but they've had a lot of different things. they got good players, but they got some young players, and they got, they got hit by COVID. That's obviously why we had to make up that game. And then he said you'd turn around and play that next game after you would smoke somebody, and they would smoke you. It would be like a 50-point swing, and it make no sense. But you're just dealing with, you know, two good teams, and – you know, that's the way certain things happen. But to me, I always go back, obviously, when we win the game, there's still mistakes when you win the game that you're trying to fix. And there's still good things that you need to enhance and, and, and try to maximize as you push forward. But they're trying to do the same thing, too. I think sometimes it gets lost in competition, um, some of those things um, that, that kind of happen that go for you and, and go against you. Thanks for the phone call. More with Coach Painter in a moment. Again, if you'd like to visit with Coach, 1-888-246-2678. Rusty, you're next on the lines. We'll visit with you when we come out of this commercial timeout. This is Boilermaker Basketball from Learfield. O'Connell. Over the middle, he's got Hopkins, the tight end. No one in front. Can they catch him? Bryson Hopkins to the touchdown. 72 yards. Partner, that's the difference between a freshman and a fifth-year senior. You get it to the guy with experience that has made those plays over his career. He goes untouched, 72 yards. Bryson Hopkins has been one of the best tight ends, not just in the conference, but nationally. On the outside. Hopkins in motion. Horvath in motion. O'Connell has a man wide open, it's Hopkins, and we're tied at 31. You've got a 31 all game with 248 left. This should be easy. This is where I thrive, you know, the basics. This is doable. I think this is my best one. The art talent is just unmatched right here. I'm proud of this one. I like yours, no doubt. Hey, bro, you ain't got a lot of me, bro. No, for real, I like how you did that. <laughs> oh, man. This is bad. Ah. Somebody's about to steal that logo. <laughs> what is this, bro? <laughs> you feel me? That's tough. That's tough. I can't lie, yours is better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> the detail is there. That's so bad. How is that so bad? I even got the gold right. There's no outline, there's no... It's a minute. I mean, my brother could have drew that, he's six. No, he's not six. <laughs> he's eight, cut that part out. Don't steal our logo, or we'll run you over with our train. <laughs> Welcome back everyone to the Matt Painter Radio Show, brought to you by Jimco Constructors. Live tonight from Wolfie's Grill. You can find us here Monday nights talking Boilermaker basketball. We'll be here next Monday, 6 o'clock, to talk Boilermaker hoops. Time now for our Pro Boilers feature, where we look at how former Purdue student athletes are doing in their professional sports careers. Pro Boilers presented by Indiana Kitchen Premium Pork Products. Get to know us at indianakitchen.com. Both our Pro Boilers and Indiana Kitchen are boiler made. And uh, today, we, well, we honor Adam Shank former Boilermaker golfer who turned pro in 2015. He has been on the PGA Tour since 2018. Last season, while playing professionally, finished 88th in the FedEx Cup standings. He's having a better season this season. Already just, uh, just 10 events into the 2022 season, Adam is ranked 65th currently. He finished third in the Shriners Children's Open just a couple of weeks ago. And so far through 10 events this year, Adam Shank has already won over $518,000, 518, so not too bad 
through 10 professional golfing events here in 2022. Adam Shank, our pro boarder feature tonight. Back to the phones we go. Rusty in Lafayette is next. Welcome, Rusty. You're on with Coach Painter. Uh, thank you. Uh, Coach Painter, we would, on behalf of uh, Lot M Tailgaters, we would like to uh, express our extreme gratitude for what a remarkable, successful season we have. And, and what you've done with this team, <clears throat> especially Zach, is just remarkable. Uh, but heading into the NC2A tournament and other tournaments, we have noticed in the last three or four years that there's a recurring pattern on how we suffer a catastrophic loss when we should be going all the way. And we're really concerned about the transition game. That is the control of the tempo when the opponent shifts from defense to offense under the basket. And we've seen a couple of flashes of that in the last two or three games. And we have the opponent going coast to coast to the other end and stuffing it uh, un unopposed. And we're just wondering, when you go into the tournament, are you thinking how can we control the tempo of the game and make sure that we don't get into a, a running uh, runaway contest with these smaller, faster teams? Could you please discuss our strategy a little bit? Thank you, Coach. Yeah. Well, to start with, we're one of the top ten scoring teams in the country, and we're the most efficient offensive team in the country. So um, that's not the worry. The worry is our size, and when we go come back in defensive transition, our communication and our ability to match up. And what happens a lot, especially with Zach, is when he's the last person down, it's hard for him to match up to someone that's not his man. So he'll run and somebody takes his man and then that person's got to shift off and then go take whoever's the last person um, that's available and then he gets back to his. We had the same issue with Zach um, in that area. Now, we get two guys back. We, get, we do pretty well in the offensive glasses, but we get two guys back. But if one of them shoots, we only have one guy back. And then we pick up the basketball. So at the nail... The nail is just the middle of the free throw line. It's that keyhole area right there. Our point guard comes in there on a shot, and then he picks up the basketball, and what we try to do is not allow them to have kick-aheads at that time. So you go and pick up the basketball. Now the number one thing is them advancing the basketball on the pass. So we try to get to that guy as quick as we can so we can – advance that basketball. So in transition defense, what you want to, what you want to be able to do, um, and the most important thing is stop the basketball, protect the paint, and know where skill is. All right, so you have to have awareness of skill. You also have to have a post awareness if you've got big guys that run the court, say like a Luca Garza, who gets those early duck ins on you. And if your big's not back, he's ducking in on one of your guards. So obviously, we work on this from an offensive standpoint, trying to expose people. But it, like, to your question, it's a really good question because our transition defense is not very good. And it, it, what happens is. Anything on the court that goes on, you've got to move to the next play. You get fouled, you don't get a call. Um, you have an open shot, you think it should go in. Uh, one of your teammates misses you on a pass, and you're mad. Uh, the ref, you know, doesn't see you get tripped. Hey, that is over. Like, you've got to sprint back on defense, get turned around, and then do all the things I talk about. And you've got to be able to build walls. You've got to be able to protect the rim, protect the paint, but you've got to build an initial wall there on top of the key is a lot of times, especially when it's centered, and not let them get in. But you also got to match up, and it's a little different than it used to be 20 years ago just because the three-pointer is such a big deal. And so, like, if you stop people from making their threes, a lot of times if you can make yours, it's, it's going to take – unless they just go to the free throw line a lot, you're going to have a real advantage there. So you're trying to get the ball stopped – and corral and build a wall, but you're also not trying to let somebody just get, like you talked about, those, those couple of those speed layups where they just break us down and they get right to the rim. So you got to do a better job of having awareness. And then once the ball gets to a side in transition, you can't, if the ball's coming up the left side in the slot, you know, you, and your man's in the right corner, you got to get to the basketball. And you've got to load up against those things. And you've got to be able to see it. You just can't run to the right corner and the ball's in the left slot and say, hey, I got my man. You know, the heck with everybody else. That's just not how you do it. But we, we've had some real fundamental breakdowns um, with that. A lot of times 
When you have your two safeties, you want to have centered safeties. So if I'm on the left side of the court, I just don't want to float back on defense on the left side of the court. I want to sprint back, get turned around, and get centered. And that's a, that's a key piece of it because offensively what you want to do is you want to attack people's backs. So you want to drive the basketball and attack people's back. You saw Jaden in the Michigan game at home. He got both of Michigan's big guys twice and dunked it just because they hadn't got turned around yet, and they're looking over their left shoulder, then their right shoulder, and he's too fast. And he's too fast, and he's going to break you down right there. you got to get, you got to get turned around at that time and see it. You're not going to make a good decision looking down your shoulder. Anytime you're sprinting back on defense and you're looking down your shoulder, you're seeing a third to half of the court. Anytime you turn around and get to the paint and look back, you're seeing the whole court, and you're keeping everybody in front of you. I always compare it to a catcher in baseball. It's why he calls the defensive plays, because he sees everything. The second baseman can't give the play to everybody. The shortstop can't give the they, they don't see everybody. You got people behind you, you got people in front of you. That's why your backline help and those centered safeties got to start communicating right away, but then they got to be able to gauge the importance of the priorities that I gave you. You got to stop the ball, you got to protect the paint, and you got to know where skill is. If I'm going to leave somebody open, I'm going to leave somebody open that's, you know, not a good shooter or kind of the lesser of all evils he's got the, the lowest percentage of everybody but it takes communication and it takes effort especially after a turnover you say well they got to us right there well sure we turned the ball over and it's four on two going the other way anytime you have a primary break um you know the regular transition is five on five but a primary break is anything that is advantageous to the offense two on one three on two four on three five on four things of that nature so we drill that you know, constantly we work on that, um, but we have to do a better job. Rusty, thank you for your phone call. This is the Matt Painter Radio Show, presented as always by Jim Co. Back in a moment, this is Boilermaker Basketball from Learfield. Jaden Ivey all in the top ten, as here is Ivey into the body to roll it in. I mean, Zach Eady and Travion Williams always stay away from each other's drum set. Saw the Step Brothers poster in the crowd. <laughs> And here is Hunter down the lane for two. Eric Hunter's first points. Goes the same way down here. It was a big time play by Coburn. They had the first six of the game combined, and Edie matches Coburn again. That could have easily. Stefanovic shows up. Coburn misses, and the follow won't be there. It is knocked around to Hunter for Purdue. Stefanovic, quick trigger for three. It's a one-point game. First place of the Big Ten on the line. That was a bear hug from Demonte Williams, and still Ivy scores. Oh, he's just sitting on that right hand, but it just doesn't matter. Plummer hits the deck. Had his pocket picked. Hunter to the rim. Oh, this is his half. I don't have to tell you. I'm telling them. Here's Ivy. Into the lane for what Purdue, pass. and he got it for Edie and a stuff. That is so good from Jaden Ivey. Misses the shot and the rebound for Caleb First, who's played some big minutes for Purdue in this game. Ivey, double clutch for two. See what Ivey does now. Poking and prodding and leaning, and he kicks it out. Got a look for Thompson, and he got it for three. Ivy oh, he lost his man, open. got to get it to him. Frazier is down. And he buried the three. It's Frazier reaching for his leg. We'll get a timeout. First place in the Big Ten on the line. If Purdue wins, it's a three-way tie. Eating upstairs. No. Got another one, and he hammers it. He smacked it right back at him. Jimco Constructors is supporting your Boilermakers as the presenting sponsor of the Mad Painter Show and proud partner of Purdue Athletics. Jimco Constructors says boiler up. Happy Valentine, uh, Valentine's Day to everyone joining us here on this Monday evening. We'll be here next Monday as well to talk Boilermaker basketball. Back to the phone lines we go, and uh, Austin checking in from Fort Wayne is joining the program. Austin, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Good evening. <clears throat> uh, Coach Painter. When you're doing individual work with your guys, either at practice during the season or in the off season, is it more beneficial to have players work on their weaknesses or have them try to improve the things they're already good at? Thank you. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, you obviously do both. 
Um, but it, it just depends on the individual and, and kind of where they are, they are in their and upside, um, their age. A lot, a lot of times when you get somebody at the end of their, your career, um, if they've picked like if they've picked something up each year, where they've made you know drastic improvement, like Sasha Stefanovic, let's use him as an example. He's much better as he's progressed using his dribble. I think we all would say that, but I wouldn't say that's his number one thing that he does. His best thing that he does is his ability to move and shoot. Like he really, we run as much action. We ran some. Terry Johnson did a good job. We ran some really good action for him yesterday. He had a couple that he missed that he normally makes, but. Um, he was. He can get away from people, and you'll find people that can shoot the basketball, but they're not necessarily good at moving and shooting. If you got somebody that can move and shoot, you can run a lot of stuff for them and a lot of different action, especially when people switch. You kept seeing us get Maryland in between switches, and sometimes you run good action, and you get somebody an open look, and they miss it. You, you can't look at it as a negative. You got to look at it as a positive because you can always go back to that and try to get something very similar, if not the same thing, and uh, expose them and get that same shot. You want as many good shots as possible. But um, it just depends. Like Zach Eady is, is a guy that has, you know, you have to work with him um, on being able to pass the basketball and being able to understand his surroundings, but also his skill level, um, his hooks over both shoulders, working towards getting that position and playing. So a guard and a big's a little bit different. Um, what gets you on the court and what keeps you off the court are the two things that matter. And a lot of times that's hard because as you go through the recruiting process, everybody just wants to talk in theory. But in reality, can you play without turning the basketball over? Um, do you know what's going on, first of all? Can you do your job on offense and defense and carry out that assignment? Like the matchups and things of that nature are really important. Sometimes you'll have games where you have a really good player that particular game is just not going to be good for them in that particular matchup. Now, they become the best player on your team. Now you kind of live with their mistakes more. And so those things are so important. So trying to communicate to them like, hey, here's what we need to work on. Here's what we're already good at. We're going to work on these things too because they're both important, as you mentioned. But here's what's going to get you on the court. And here's what's going to keep you off the court. If you can get them to understand that, then it's practical to them and they understand now they can put in a lot of work. You will get some guys, not a lot. We don't have a lot of this. You will get guys that work on things that they want to work on and what they want to be good at. And they're probably never going to be great at something like that. Now, there's some people that can do that. Jaden Ivey is, is a guy that he's a young player. And you see the upside, you see the ceiling, you see how great he is, but he's still a young player. So, like, he has the biggest ceiling of anybody probably that we've had that could take off and go be a starter on an NBA team or actually an NBA all-star. Like, he has that kind of ability. But he's young. You know, it's not – you know, he didn't average 35 points in high school. He averaged – 18 as a junior, he averaged 12 as a senior. You know, he's still coming. He got injured at the, early, at the start of last year. So it, it just depends on each guy and kind of where they are and uh, what they can do. You know, what, what is their skill level? What is their upside? And uh, what's their work ethic? And do they have the capacity to take what you're given? 90% of the world, whether you're in college or the NBA, you're a role player. That's hard for people to do. A lot of people want to play shortstop and lead off. You know, that's just, that's just the way it is. We're all, we're all that way. We all want to bat fourth, bat clean up, play first, play the position. that we. It's just not the way it is. I always tell our guys, like, well, can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? Well, not if we sign Kevin Durant, you can't. <laughs> no, I mean, Kevin Durant's going to play. Like, you know, and so just to put it in perspective of, you know, you got to get yourself in that position so you can play through your mistakes. You get on a really good team like we have, like, you got a lot of, Things. we got guys sometimes that I, I don't play very much I think are great, but we have a lot of great players, and that's the way it is. And, like, last night you get into that situation, and, like, our margin of error just shifted real quick when you're down 12 mm -hmm. with 10 minutes to go. Like, you've got to roll, and you've got to go, and, like, now you've got to stick with a certain group. And fair or not fair, it's just the kind of way it is. You're not going to understand that unless you coach. 
You're not going to understand that unless you've played for a long time and you've been in competition in team sports. Speaking of Jaden Ivey's youth, yesterday was his 20th birthday, by the way. He celebrated a birthday with a win over Maryland. Uh, more with Coach Painter when we come back to the Matt Painter Radio Show live tonight from Wolfie's Grill. This is Boilermaker Basketball from Learfield. Here's Ivy, the high screen from Edie, drives and leads it in. I get it. Look, Penn State, 9 o'clock tip, long day, hard to get up for. It. There's Mason Gillis. Three breakdowns that have led to easy baskets for Michigan. Williams working on Dickinson, the jump hook, count it, and the foul. Now back into his own. Yeah, into the 2 3. Here's Williams. And gets the roll. Ivy drives. Lays it off the window. So explosive with that first step. Too many breakdowns of responsibility are going to give Michigan confidence. Here's Edie. Count it. And one. Williams. Jump hook is good. <laughs> Just pretty. It's pretty, isn't it? Man. The high low action, that one's knocked away. Right, now you need the space to see if you can keep this matchup. The problem is now you gotta switch back off. That's very good. Wow, absolutely. Let's play some one on one. Dickinson's got 12. Travion's got eight. Make it <laughs> 10. <laughs> so good. Hey, your turn. Step back three. Got it. Guy Abate working on Gillis. Stolen by Hunter Jr. Brooks turns the corner and Ivy sends it to the third row. Welcome back, everyone, to the Matt Painter Radio Show, live tonight at Wolfie's Grill with the largest view of the game outside of Mackey Arena. A huge thank you to Wolfie's Grill. They have served as the host of the Coach Painter Show all season long. Coach Painter, Wednesday night on the road at Northwestern, the rematch with the Wildcats. Purdue won the first meeting earlier in the year. The one game Purdue played without Jaden Ivey beat the Wildcats. However, what about a scouting report on the Cats the second time around? Well, they've, they've been in every game, and even though we won by 20, it was really more 10 to 12 until the very end, and we pushed it out. But, um, you know, talented, uh, guys can score. They've, they've been in every single game. They've lost a lot of close games. Um, but, like, from their guards to their bigs, I mean, everybody can score the basketball, and we have to do a good job. Um, the games where we've really gotten ourselves in a tough spot um, – you know, first half against Michigan, first half against Indiana, the Maryland game, you see the turnovers. And I think no matter who we're playing, um, when we have taken care of the ball, we've done a pretty good job on the offensive end. And that's what we got to do against them. We, we got to not let them disrupt us. They're very active. Um, they did a great job um, on Kofi Coburn in Illinois and really rattled him, fouled him, kept fouling him, um, you know, throwing different people at him. But, but you got to be able to – to handle some hits and handle some fouls and some plays and make, you know, fundamentally sound, you know, decisions on the offensive end. So I think that's key for us to, to execute offensively, to get our defense set, because I, you know, they're a team that can really score the basketball. Chris has done a really good job with them. They're very physical and active. And uh, I think those, those are going to be the real keys for the game on Wednesday night. Our final segment of the Matt Painter Show when we come back to Wolfie's Grill. This is Boilermaker Basketball from Learfield. and Wahab couldn't catch it. Gillis dropping a dime. The Super Duke team that was blown out of Ann Arbor on Thursday. Stefanovic badly needed 
triple. As the other guys relish the opportunity to see what they can do in an expanded role, and oftentimes it plays out like this, and there's Edie, one of the first offensive rebounds. And a beautiful setup on that last sequence by Martinez. That is Ivy. If Purdue can't adjust to dealing with the pick and roll action, they're going to have a tough time coming all the way back in this one. Nothing they can do with that from Edie. But right now, Purdue facing its largest deficit of the afternoon. Stefanovic, that's a three-point jack. It's an excellent free throw shooting team. Russell again, it's a good look. Offensive rebound, Wahab. Goes right back up top, and he's pancaked by Edie. If you do it in four minutes or more, that kind of run, that's, a, that's what we call a jog. But this is a run. Purdue has retaken the lead. Purdue 21 and 4, number three team in the country. Can Maryland steal one here in West Lafayette? That is Williams in a thing of beauty. Double bonus for both teams. Every whistle here. Here comes Ivy. He puts it down. And Eric Turner still tried to get it inside. Inbound to Scott, turns the corner to the wreck. Knocked out of his hands, Gillis has it. Now to Williams, and it is over. Here with the final segment of our Matt Painter radio show. Thank you to Wolfie's Grill, excellent host as always. We'll be back here next Monday night from 6 to 7 to talk Boilermaker basketball. Uh, final nugget here before we say so long. You know, last uh, last Monday night I was talking about Purdue's record over the last 10 years and what I consider to be the major winter holidays. I know I threw Groundhog's Day in there, but I'm hosting the show now, so I get to pick the days. So I got to thinking about this. Here we are on Valentine's Day. Uh, at least since Coach Painter's been at Purdue, 17 years as the head coach at Purdue, Purdue's record when playing on Valentine's Day. Any guesses, anyone? There haven't been very many of them. I don't know if Coach put this in his contract or not, that we don't have to play on Valentine's Day. We've only played twice. Only played twice in the last 17 years with Coach Painter as our coach. And Purdue has won both of those games. Purdue is 2-0 and on Valentine's. So I say schedule more Valentine's games. Uh, yeah, 2-0, and not too bad. And by the way, I know I said this earlier, but if indeed you and your sweetheart went out of your way to spend your Valentine's evening by taking in the Matt Painter Radio Show, good for you, and thank you. Uh, that is really showing your Boilermaker loyalty, that's for certain. Hey, hey hun, how would you like to spend Valentine's? How about we take in the Coach Painter Radio Show? Thank you for that. We do, we do greatly appreciate it. Uh, busy week again for Purdue this week, fans. Wednesday night, 9 o'clock at Northwestern. Our pregame show here on the radio network will begin at 8 o'clock. And then Sunday afternoon, 5.30 is the tip-off at home against Rutgers. Boilermakers taking on the Scarlet Knights. We all know what happened last time we played Rutgers. And then that, that is, again, a 5.30 tip-off. We'll be on the air at 4.30 with that broadcast on Sunday. Uh, thanks to Teo, who was our in-studio engineer today. Thanks to Wes Scott, our audio engineer on site. For head coach Matt Painter, I'm Rob Blackman thanking you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your Valentine's evening, everyone. And we'll talk to you Wednesday night from Evanston when Purdue plays Northwestern. Good night.